One of the most common types of linear models is for growth and decay. So these kind of models have the form dx dt is equal to k times x, where k of t, I'm sorry, x of t naught is equal to x naught. k is called the constant of proportionality. Now, this is a model for diverse phenomena. Several examples of growth and decay includes growth of certain populations, velocity, acceleration could be considered a growth decay. We will be looking at several examples next. Our first example involves bacterial growth. And so we have a culture initially has P naught number of bacteria. At T equals one hour, the number of bacteria is measured to be three halves P naught. If the rate of growth is proportional to the number of bacteria, P of T present at time T, we wish to determine the time necessary for the number of bacteria to triple. So the first thing we need to do is we need to set up our initial value problem. So rate of growth is DP DT. And it's proportional to the number of bacteria. So it's K P of T with P of zero equal to P naught. Right? This is the initial number of bacteria. Now we wish to solve this initial value problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this into dp dt minus k times p of t is equal to zero. This is a first order linear. So our integrating factor mu of t will be e to the negative kt, right? Because the integral of negative k is negative kt. So now we have e to the negative kt times dp dt minus ke to the negative kt times p of t is still equal to zero. So this left hand side is a product rule. It's e to the negative, it's the derivative of e to the negative kt times p of t. If we now integrate both sides, we're going to get e to the negative kt times p of t is equal to the integral of zero, which is just some constant c. So p of t is therefore e to the kt, I'm sorry, c e to the kt. Using the initial condition, p of zero is equal to p naught. We get that p 
naught is equal to c e to the zero, which is simply c. So c is p naught. So we now have p of t is equal to p naught e to the kt. However, we still need to find this k value. Well, to do this, we make use of the fact that at t equals one hour, we have three halves p naught. That is, p of one is three halves p naught. So p of one is three halves p naught, which is also equal to p naught e to the k. This means that three halves is equal to three, I'm sorry, three halves is equal to e to the k, which means our k is the natural log of three halves. So our model, our growth model is p of t equals p naught e to the t log of three halves. We can now use this model to determine how long it takes for the number of bacteria to triple. So we want P of T to be three times P naught. And now we just solve this for T. So this means that three has to be E to the T log of three halves. So log of three has to be T log of three halves. So t is the log of three over the log of three halves. And this is approximately 2.71 hours. So it'll take approximately 2.71 hours for the number of bacteria to triple. Our next example deals with half-life. Half-life is simply the time it takes for one half of the atoms in an initial mount to disintegrate into atoms of another element. This is essentially a measure of stability of, a, of the radioactive substance. The longer the half-life, the more stable the substance is. So here we have a breeder reactor converts relatively stable uranium-238 into the isotope plutonium-239. After 15 years, it is determined that 0.043% of the initial amount of plutonium has disintegrated. We wish to find the half-life of this isotope, assuming that the rate of disintegration is proportional to the amount remaining. So again, the first thing we want to do is we want to set up our initial value problem. So the rate of disintegration is proportional to the amount remaining. We're also told that the initial value is A naught. Now we can solve the IVP.
this is a linear differential equation with an integrating factor of e to the negative kt. So we have e to the negative kt dA dt minus k e to the negative kt a is equal to zero. That's a product rule. So d dt of e to the negative kt a is equal to zero. And so e to the negative kt a is equal to a constant. So a of t is e to the kt. Using the initial condition, we find that a naught is equal to c e to the kt. I'm sorry, t is zero. So it's e to the zero, which is just c. And so we have a of t is equal to a naught e to the kt. We now need to find k. And we do this using the fact that after 15 years, 0.043% of the initial amount has disintegrated. So A of 15, well, if point 0.047%, I'm sorry, 0.043% has decayed, that means that 1 minus 0 0.000043 remains. So here, remember, we're just converting from percent, and percent, of course, means per 100. So we just divided the 0 0.043 by 100. So this is 0 0.9957. So 99.57% still remains. Of course, this equals a naught e to the 15k. So 0.9957 has to be e to the 15k. This means that k itself would have to be the log of 0.9957 divided by 15. And so our model, a of t, is a naught. Now, it's going to be kind of a pain to write this as an exponent. So I'm going to use another common way of writing the exponential function. exp of the log of 0.9957 divided by 15, and then that whole thing is times t. So this notation is, this is the power of e. Now we are able to solve the problem. The problem was to determine the half-life. So we want to find a value of t such that a of t 
is one half a naught. So a half has to equal e to the log 0.9957 over 15 times t. So log of a half is log of 0 0.9957. All over 15t. So t would be 15 log of a half divided by log of 0.9957. And this is approximately 24,177 years. So the half-life of plutonium-239 is about 24,100, I'm sorry, this is not a 77, this is 74, 24,174 years. Our third example deals with carbon dating. So, in about 1950, a team of scientists at the University of Chicago, led by the chemist Willard Libby, devised a method using a radioactive isotope of carbon as a means of determining the approximate ages of carbonaceous fossilized matter. The theory of carbon dating is based on the fact that the radioisotope carbon-14 is produced in the atmosphere by the action of cosmic radiation on nitrogen-14. That ratio of the amount of carbon-14 to the stable carbon-12 in the atmosphere appears to be a constant. And as a consequence, the proportionate amount of the isotope present in all living organisms is the same as that in the atmosphere. When a living organism dies, the absorption of carbon-14, either by breathing, eating, or photosynthesis, ceases. By comparing the proportionate amount of carbon-14 with the constant amount ratio found in the atmosphere, it is possible to, to obtain a reasonable estimation of its age. The method is based on the knowledge of the half-life of carbon-14. The accepted half-life of carbon-14 is called the Cambridge half-life. And it is close to 5,730 years. So whenever we do any kind of carbon dating problem, we accept the half-life of carbon-14 to be 5,730 years. So for this example, a fossilized bone is found to contain 0.1% of its original amount of carbon-14, and we wish to determine the age of this fossil. So set up the initial value problem. So dA dt is proportional to A, and of course, A of 0 will be A0. This is identical to the initial value problem from the previous example, which makes sense because carbon dating is half-life. So I'm not going to go through all that again.
our model is a of t equals a naught e to the kt. Our k this time will be different. So we need to now find k. Well, we know the half-life, so A of 5,730 has to be one half of A naught. And so one half is equal to E to the K T, but T is 5730. So log of a half is 5730k, and so k is log of a half over 5730. So, a of t will be a naught e to the log a half over 5730 all times t. We can now solve the problem. So we want to determine the age of the fossil. So a of t, right, and we know that 0.1% of the original amount of carbon-14 still remains, so this has to be 0 0.001 A0, and that equals A0 E to the log half over 5730, all times T. So 0 0.001 is equal to E to this, so log of 0 0.001 has to equal log of a half over 5730 times t, and so t is 5730 times the log of point 0, 0, 1, all over the log of one half. And we find that this is about 57,104 years. So this fossil is approximately 57,104 years old. We now look at Newton's law of cooling or warming. So this is given by dt dt is equal to k t minus T sub M. T is the temperature of the object. For time greater than zero. T sub M is the temperature of the medium that the object is in. And of course, K is a constant of proportionality. We're not going to look at deriving this. This is done in physics. So when a cake is removed from an oven, its temperature is measured at 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Three minutes later, its temperature is 200 degrees Fahrenheit. We want to determine how long it will take for the cake to cool off to room temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So in this case, the temperature of our medium will be 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the temperature of the room that the cake is out cooling in. So we set up our initial value problem, dt dt is equal to k times t minus 70, and the initial value t of 0 is 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's now solve the IVP. All right, so this is separation of variables. So we're going to get dt over t minus 70 is equal to k dt. So we integrate both sides, and we're going to get the log of the absolute value of t minus 70 is equal to k times t. This means, of course, that t minus 70 is e to the kt. I'm sorry, c, a constant, times e to the kt. So t is 70 plus ce to the kt. We now use the initial condition to determine our constant C. So T of zero has to be 300. This means that our C is 300 minus, minus 70, which is 230. So the model for this problem is 70 plus 230 e to the kt. We now need to find k. Well, we know that after three minutes, the temperature of the cake has cooled to 200. This means that 130 is 230 e to the 3k. So 13 over 23 is e to the 3k. log of 13 over 23 is 3k, and so we get k to be log of 13 over 23 divided by 3. And so the model we're going to be using is 70 plus 230e to the log 13 over 23, all over 3, all times t. So now, we can go about solving the problem. We want to determine how long it'll take for the temperature of the cake to reach 70 degrees. So this would mean that 0 is equal to 230e to this. So 0 
is e to the log 13 over 23, all over 3, times t. This poses a problem. e to any real number is never 0. Let's look at this, though. The natural log of 13 over 23. Well, 13 over 23 is less than 1. So the log of it would be less than 0. So this is a negative value. So the exponent of e is negative. Well, recall that the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the negative x is 0. This would imply that our time t here approaches infinity. That means that the cake will never actually reach 70 degrees exactly. However, for practical purposes, there will be a time where it's close enough to 70 degrees that we'll say it reaches 70 degrees. To do this, or to see this, we're going to have to create a table of values and see when our function here, I'm sorry, here reaches. 70. So I will be using Mathematica to create our table of values. So the first thing that I need to do is I need to create or define my function. So it was capital T of T. So the underscore is telling Mathematica that little t is the function variable is defined colon equals and our function was 70 plus 230 times e exp to the log of 13 over 23 times t all over 3. So in Mathematica log is understood to be base e so this is the natural log and now i want to create my table so i use the table command first column i want is time little t second column i want is the temperature but i want a numerical approximation i want decimals so i'm going to use the n command So I want t to start at 0, and let's go up to 100. And I want it to change by 5 degrees with each step. Now I'm going to tell it to put it into table form. Now I just hit Shift Enter, and here is my table. So. After 40 minutes, we can see it's cooled down to 70.1 degrees. After 45 minutes, it's cooled to 70.0. This seems to be a good benchmark, actually. I'd say it's close enough to 70. So it would appear that it would only take about 45 minutes for this cake to cool to about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. You can notice out to four decimal places after 85 minutes, it's already hit 70. 
But again, 70.0 to 1 decimal place is fair enough. We conclude our study of first order linear models by looking at series circuits. The first one we look at will be a circuit that looks like this. So this up here is an inductor. This is a resistor. And this is the battery or the power source. We're going to be looking at Kirchhoff's second law. Just making sure I spell it right. Which states that the, that the sum of the voltage drop across the inductor And the voltage drop across the resistor is the same as the impressed voltage on the circuit. So this will give us the differential equation L times di dt plus R times I is equal to E where L is the inductance, R is the resistance, E is the impressed voltage, and I is current. So I label these, this here is L, that's R, and that is E. There's a second type of circuit that we're going to look at. Once again, this here is a resistor. This down here is now a capacitor. And again, this is the battery or the power source. So here, Kirchhoff's second law states that the voltage drop across a capacitor plus the voltage drop across the resistor is equal to the impressed voltage on the circuit. So we're going to get R times I plus 1 over C times Q is equal to E. Where once again, 
R is the resistance. C is called the capacitance. I is the current. Q is the charge on the capacitor. And E is the impressed voltage. By definition, I is change in charge with respect to time. So we can rewrite the law as R dQ dt plus 1 over C times Q is equal to E. final example for this lesson. A 12 volt battery is connected to a series circuit in which the inductance is a half a Henry and the resistance is 10 ohms. We wish to determine the current if the initial current is zero. So we set up our initial value problem as always. So we're going to be using L di dt plus r times i is equal to e. And the initial condition is i of 0 equals 0. So now we solve the IVP. I'm sorry, before we solve it, we plug in our known values. So L, we know, is one half. So we're going to have one half di dt. The resistance is 10, so plus 10i is equal to E, which is 12. Now we can go ahead and solve the initial value problem. So let's get rid of this one half. Multiply everything by two and we're gonna get di dt plus 20i is equal to 24. This is now linear in i. So we have an integrating factor e to the 20t. Multiplying everything by that, we get e to the 20t di dt plus 20i, I'm sorry, 20e to the 20t times i is equal to 24e to the 20t. The term on the left is a product rule, so this is d dt of e to the 20t times i. And this still equals 24e to the 20t. We can now integrate both sides. So we're going to get e to the 20t times i is the integral of 24e to the 20t dt. This is 24 over 20 e to the 20t plus a constant. Well, of course, that simplifies to 6 fifths e to the 20t plus a constant.
Now, we need to divide both sides by that e to the 20t. So, i is simply 6 fifths plus c e to the negative 20t. We use our initial value to find this c. So the initial value, of course, was i of 0 equals 0. 0 is equal to 6 fifths plus c e to the 0. That's just 6 fifths plus c. So c has to be negative 6 fifths. So our current as a function of time is 6 fifths minus 6 fifths e to the negative 20t. And this is actually what we were asked to find. That concludes this lesson. I hope you've learned something, and we will see you in the next one.